Hey everyone, this is Josh, back with Cardboard Chronicles. Today we have a very special guest, Nat Turner. Uh, Nat has what I would consider to be probably the best basketball collection in the world, and he is kind enough to join us today. So, Nat, I really appreciate you coming on. How's it going? Absolutely, going well. Yeah, so why don't you just start us off, tell us about yourself and your background in collecting. Uh, it's kind of a long story. I started, uh, I collected cards when I was a kid. Uh, I was born in Houston uh, in 1986, probably 1990. I started collecting baseball with my dad, uh, Astros and Braves. He's a Braves fan. Uh, I started getting into basketball in 95. Uh, Kevin Garnett was the first kind of rookie card I owned. Hmm. Uh, 96, I got really into it. I was 10 years old. Kobe, obviously, Iverson, Real, that, that rookie year, Marbury. I would buy a lot of packs at the, in this local card store called The Dugout, which was at the Woodlands Mall. Um, I remember I pulled some cool cards in 97, 98, 98, 99. Um, you know, was really a ba- baseball and basketball card collector. I, don't, I didn't really collect anything else. And then um, I think like most people, I kind of took a break, you know, early in high school, um, which for me was 2001. I think my last year, I kind of collected back then was when Steve Francis was a rookie, which I think was like 01, something like that. Um, and then went to college and I actually got in, I, I love following kind of, kind of generational athletes. And so when LeBron came out, I was enamored by him and, and, and I started picking up collecting him just exclusively him. I really didn't buy anything else other than him. That was Oh three Oh four. Uh, so I bought, I think I maybe four or five of each of his rookie cards. Um, and I still own all of them and I tried to have a Beckett nine, five BGS nine, five of each one. And that kind of snowballed. <laughs> and so I started getting, I was on eBay a lot looking at his cards and I started noticing, you know, the cards that I wish I had owned when I was a kid, um, you know, back in, you know, fifth, sixth grade. And, and um, I was fortunate enough to sell a company in t- 2009, 2010. They gave me, um, you know, some some spending money, so to speak, on uh, on on cards. And, uh, you know, I just went after, you know, the cards I wish I'd owned. Right. That's really it. And I've kind of started collecting some stuff that I, I didn't collect growing up, things that, you know, my dad liked, things like vintage baseball. Um, you know, my dad, the first card I ever owned was a 1975 Topps Hank Aaron in horrible condition. And so I bought, you know, a PSA 10 version of that, um, mini actually mini version. And then, uh, that in snowballed and buying all the Hank Aaron cards and all the Nolan Ryan cards. And then I'm now live in New York. So I'm buying all the Mickey Mantle cards. And so <laughs> it's a disease. It was definitely an addiction and a disease. <laughs> um, so you kind of went into what you collect, but try to summarize like what you focus on mainly uh specifically basketball um yeah basketball is i would say a mixture it's it's rare 90s cards um you know again going back to nostalgia i think more than anything um mainly parallels and inserts i don't really collect the you know sets the autograph sets or any of those things but i'll do it like you know for a few different players i collect michael jordan and kobe from 90s uh player sets um, I collect LeBron, only rookie year stuff, weirdly. I'm sure that'll change at some point. Uh, and then unopened wax. Uh, it's not really wax, but these are aluminum packs. But I, I collect uh, foil packs. I collect, you know, unopened boxes of 90s, also 2003-04, LeBron's rookie year. Um, and then just, you know, a few other random things, like, you know, big big name rookie cards, like, uh, you know, Magic, you know, Bird, that kind of stuff. You know, the, the key Hall of Fame players. Um and I'm sure I'm forgetting some things, but as as it, as it relates to basketball, and then there are a couple sets that I do, um, mainly the rare parallel sets from the '90s. So Precious Metal Gems, Star Rubies, cred- Essential Credentials, Brilliance, 24 Karat Gold, stuff like that. So did you <clears> ever <throat> start with just certain players from those sets, and then you just sort of wanted to get all of them, or have you always wanted to complete those sets? Uh, the Precious Metal Jim's Green one, I actually wanted to complete the set as well as the red. So I, I, a few people know this. I pulled a Kerry Kittle's PMG Green when I was in 11 years old. And I remember pulling it. I remember being like, what is this? It was upside down in the pack. The rest of the cards were up forward facing. This one was back. I remember flipping it over, and it was like one of those moments where I was like, wow, this is really cool, you know, design-wise and everything. And so um, I never pulled another one. I, I ended up pulling like a – Byron Russell red or something back then I forget it was one of is another kind of common or semi star <clears throat> my friend owns the Kobe I remember because he traded it to the card store I referred to earlier for like a couple boxes of tops chrome I think uh, I mean it was you know 
And so um, that set had always stuck with me. I, in fact, I remember when I was buying the LeBron stuff, I ran across, I saw a random green on the eBay. I was like, oh, that's the same set from, at that point, seven years before. Um, and being you know, very interested. That was actually Jason Kidd. And so I bought the Jason Kidd. Uh, and then remember Gary Payton was this, I have a weird memory, but the Gary Payton was the second one. And then, and it kind of snowballed. So that set, I started that way. Um, uh, the Ruby set, um, you know, I think Ruby's and PMG's are like the two iconic nineties parallels, uh, essential credentials probably being the third. And so, and refractors of course, but you know, as far as the serial numbered ones go. And so I was, uh, Ruby's just was like, oh, I'm doing impressionable gems. I might as well do Ruby's. Um, a couple of the sets is because I already owned the hardest cards. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I kind of said, all right, like if I already own, you know, what's an example, like Fleer Brilliance, 24 karat, like, all right, I already own Kobe and a few of the key cards might as well go for the full set. Um, right. it'd be cool to own it. Um, but yeah, that's about it. Um, so obviously your immediate goal is to finish a lot of the sets. What's like your long term goal? Like talking, like <clears throat> thinking more in terms of, um, like investments or, just sort of like your long term, how you, how you envision your collection for the rest of your life, I guess. Would you would you ever sell out? Would you change anything? Or are you just kind of just finishing the sets and just keep going? Um, I, I think the same in life. I don't really plan outside of six months from now. Um, you know, I think one thing I know for sure is I don't think I'll ever sell the collection. It's, it's not, a, it's never been about, you know, the money. And thank, thankfully, I'm lucky enough for it. You know, it, it wouldn't make a difference either way if I sold it. Um, you know, personally. And so, which is again, very fortunate. And so the cards are special enough. Like I, as I said to you kind of before the podcast, like, you know, I know what I paid for some of these cards, but I I almost don't even care because it doesn't matter what someone would offer me. I have sold cards historically if they're duplicates and it's to someone who's a true collector. And I I made this joke to someone that every time I've sold a card, I've regretted it, uh, either because I sold it for too little or because the person I ended up seeing it through PWCC on eBay, like three weeks later. Yep. And it just pisses me off because, you know, I'm a collector and I, you know, I, I, I cherish the cards and people who are in it just for the money, you know, typically I won't uh, interact with for much longer. <laughs> so, um, and so in terms of that's the only thing I know is I probably won't sell out. In terms of goals, uh, you know, it's, it's every six months is different. You know, it's, it's the disease I talked about, but, you know, I, I go after whatever is interesting at the time. It's a true, it's a true passion or hobby for me. And so, you know, if I care about, you know, a certain set at the, at the given time that's keeping me interested in, and it's a hobby, it's a project, it's, it's fun. You know, I've lost, I've noticed, like, I've lost interest in certain Jordan. Like, I had a, I, I tried to get a BGS 9.5 of every 90s Jordan card and 80s card, and I got pretty far, and then I kind of lost interest just because, you know, I was like, all right, like, I kind of got, I have, like, 900 of them now, I don't really need more. And then I moved on to some of the sets, um, and every year is kind of evolving, so who knows what I'll collect next year. I didn't collect wax until two years ago. Now I have probably hundreds of boxes taking up every shelf in my office, and my wife pointed out all (laughs) of her books are now in the storage room. Um, So, yeah, every year's a little different. So we talked before we came on a little bit about some of the prices that you bought these cards at, So, and you've seen the current prices. What are your thoughts on the trends of the current prices, and where do you see it going in the future? Yeah, you know... um, it's pretty, I mean, I've been doing this for a while, you know, I, I, in earnest as an adult since 2010, so eight years, but then, you know, I used to display at card shows in the late 90s when I was a kid. Um, so I've seen, you know, and in vintage baseball, there's a lot more data because, you know, these cards ba- date back to the 50s and there's sales data dating back to then. Um, you know, in general, it's, you know, scarcity value drives most things in life as far as pricing goes. And most cards are scarce from the 90s as far as, you know, serial number. Like there's when serial numbers came in, like you kind of you kind of, you know, had this built in. OK, you know, there's 50 versions of this, blah, blah, blah. Uh, so, you know, you kind of know that you're you're safe from an investment perspective. Um, so I, I have a pretty bullish view on this over time. I think the only risk is if people stop collecting cards altogether. But I've been. You know, like people say, oh, baseball is going to not be baseball franchises won't be worth as much in the future because, you know, every the fans are getting older. But, you know, like last year that changed with, you know, in the year before with the Cubs and the Strohs winning. And, and I think it's same basketball is all of a sudden like the fastest growing sport in America and also in Asia. So there's more people entering the hobby. Um, you know, I'm encouraged by that. You know, I'm selling a couple duplicate cards to these like, you know, there's a 
17 year old kid who emailed me you know he's trying to build a collection of kobe bryant cards i'm like that's you know awesome like he wasn't even alive when <laughs> you know when uh, when kobe was a rookie like i was um so you know i think i'm pretty bullish on it i think you know people have a lot on the forums have talked about you know the authenticity problems the the counterfeits being being a um risk you know i i have the opposite opinion which is that if you have true authentic authentication and verification like sales okay i purchased the card a lot of my cards you know i bought in slabs because i wanted to have a date you know associated with when the card was slab um which i'm glad i did in hindsight um you know i think the value of those will be even higher if you can prove that it's real um so i think for cards that you know are going to be uh, you know, at risk of those things, I think prices will go even higher as long as they're slabbed and you have a, you know, a verified date as to when it was purchased from someone reputable. Um, like, for example, I think my, my Flickr account, like, you, there's a published date of when I uploaded the photos. I've noticed people referencing that. Like, if I have a card, like, on a, on a board, they'll say, well, Nat uploaded this card in 2010, therefore it's authentic. Um, at what That's completely unintentional. But, um, you know, I think if you can do that, then prices should continue. But, um you know, I think a lot of it depends on more getting more people interested in the hobby over time. I, th I think you made a great point about the the rapid growth of the NBA in general, and just more more fans being interested, more people entering the hobby. And I also agree on the uh, the point of the fakes actually helping value because, like, you're gonna just pay the premium for the guy that has you know the true authentic copy. Yeah. Um, well, there's efforts going on in the industry for authentication of '90s cards based on certain analysis of the cards, which I can't get too much into, but uh, I'm helping them. And uh, I think if that continues, which it is, because the dollar values are justifying it now, it's kind of like artwork where, you know, if a card's $10,000, like you'll pay $500 to make sure it's authentic. Sure. And that's a price point that actually, you know, it could take a couple hours to do that. And $500 is more than enough to pay someone a couple hours worth of time to authenticate the card. So it, the numbers are starting to make sense for that, you know, for, for, the grading firms or otherwise to take this more seriously. So I'm, I'm pretty optimistic about it. Yeah, we, uh, I started, or I, I didn't start one of those threads, but I'm pretty involved in one of those threads with the fakes because I had yep. obtained a couple yep. of fake pennies. So, yep. And uh, to your point, PSA has really done a great job of reaching out to us and getting ahead of that. Um, I, and I know I have a couple of fakes in my collect. I, I figured I figured out which ones they are. Oh, and I'm really? glad I did because I'm able to compare them. So. This Kobe uh, Star Ruby's Team Skybox, someone pointed out on one of the forums. It's like, oh, it's interesting. So I bought two more that I knew were authentic, and I'm now comparing them and I'm sending them in to uh, PSA to help them. So that's awesome, dude. <clears throat> um, so you get a lot of attention from the just the, the sheer dollar value of your collection, but can you talk about what it means to you personally, just kind of value aside? Because um, I know, speaking uh, from experience, you don't get a collection like that without being very passionate about the hobby and uh, very dedicated and putting a lot of your time into it. So can you just speak to that a little bit? Yeah, you know, real quick on the value thing, like I don't even think about it. Um, you know, I know a collector, whenever I show them a card, and the first question is not, how much is this worth? <laughs> um, and, you know, I, generally someone who's just centered in the money, like, oh, I hand them a Jordan game jersey auto card, and like, oh, what's this worth? You know, I sometimes I can't even tell you because it's not even on my mind. Um, so yeah, it's a true passion in other words. And so I'm fortunate that, you know, some of these things are good investments, but you know, I think that's, I don't, if it weren't, I think I would probably still be doing it. Um, you know, I probably spend two or three hours a day. It seems crazy, but, um, you know, going through eBay, going through auction sites, cause baseball, a lot of that stuff's not on eBay. It's on heritage and these other places, golden auctions, et cetera. Um, and so, you know, and a lot of time going back and forth with collectors on email or Google Hangouts or Instagram, you know trying to locate cards and it's become, you know, like a part of my daily routine of just, you know, being able to unplug for a little bit and focus on something I, I find really fun. Uh, and the chase, you know, like, you know how rare these cards are and, you know, chasing something and the reward, uh, you know, like the satisfaction of it showing up in the mail. Uh, you know, like when I get home from work seeing five or six bubble mailers, uh, generally from probe scene or PWCC, uh, you know, are, it's pretty exciting. You know, what, what was I able to locate? Um, you know, privately as well. Um, you know, I, I was mentioned before, like I scan every single card that I've purchased since probably 2010. Um, not everyone, because I buy a lot of commons and, and things that, uh, you know, are not worth scanning, but um, 
uh, every graded card, every rare card, and you know, there's probably 10 cards a day that come in. So that takes, I've gotten it down to about 25 seconds per card where I can scan it and do the work in Photoshop with the front and back and upload to Flickr. And so that's therapeutic. I actually enjoy it. I don't, I just phase out while I'm doing it. Um, and, uh, you know, it's become like a true part of my routine. Um, I don't know what I would do without it. <laughs> yeah, whenever I talk to the high end guys, like a lot of people think, oh, you just have more money. You just, you just buy up the cards. But every time I talk to a high end collector, it's very much the opposite. It's like that person puts in more time than the rest of oh, us. Yeah. I feel like I know people who buy cards, then they have no idea what that is. They search eBay, they sort it by value, and then they just buy the most expensive ones. Right. They think those would be the ones that appreciate. And you probably make money doing that. But, you know, I could tell you, you know, I could probably talk to you for two hours about the precious metal gem set, you know, and all the intricacies of it, right? Um, and so it's, it's you know, you can figure out who, who cares about it. But I, I don't think it's a bad thing that people treat it as an investment. I'm not saying ill will things about them, ill things about them, but, you know, th those aren't the folks that, you know, I, I, I would, you know, sell cards to, <laughs> um, you know, because the cards are special. One of the things I've talked about on the channel is that uh, if your um, collection is rooted in passion, then the, the investment will kind of work itself out. Yeah. You'll, you'll do better in the long run if you're actually passionate about it up front. Yeah, I lost money on stuff. Like, I, you know, for uh, I'm not very proud of it. But for a period of time, I was a player collector of Gerald Green. <laughs> that, didn't work, <laughs> that didn't work out too well. Uh, so, Great. All right. Um, so one question I want to ask you is about specifically when you, I think you're, you mentioned 2010 was kind of when you came back and started going after the 90s cards. What was that like when you first got back in and uh, what was the landscape at the time and what was like your... What was your approach to going after that set, those sets? Yeah, you know, it was kind of interesting. The, um, the, a lot of people at the time were telling me, oh, the prices have been run up. Uh, you know, there's, the cards are so hard to find. Um, you know, it's not worth, you know, the, all these cards are in player collections. And I, and I remember that because I, I connected with a couple of my old buddies from, you know, when I was a kid. And um, they were actually right. But it turns out if a couple auctions sell for, record prices, people notice that and they start thinking, oh, you know, my cards have jumped in value and cards started coming out of the woodwork. And so at first it was kind of a trickle where like, you know, I remember the season ticket auto I really wanted, the Michael Jordan UD3 season ticket auto. I was like, all right, you know, I know it's a rare card. I haven't seen one in a while, but then one surfaced and I, you know, I don't remember what I paid, but like it was definitely a most, I remember getting made fun of actually on blowout cards. Uh, and I was like, okay, like, I don't care, but you know, lo and behold, two weeks later, the SP Authentic Auto showed up on eBay, and the guy was like, you know, I remember I'm a blowout. He's like, yeah, you know, I, you know, I can't really justify holding on to it if if Michael Jordan cards are worth, I think it was like four thousand dollars. I mean, it'd be like twenty five now or something. So you know, I always kind of laugh looking back because you know it, it, things were scarce, but the the hobby goes in waves. You know, the the people will unload cards. You know. For many reasons, uh, you know, maybe even myself one day, God forbid, and and or they just lose interest and move on to other hobbies, right? That could happen to me in a few years, I, I suppose. I doubt it, but um, and that's kind of what happened in 2010. I remember a few player, a few collections. People just moved. Like I bought a few collections. Most of my cards I bought individually, mainly through eBay, and then I found a couple of people um, who were willing to kind of be scouts for me, who would go out and locate the cards, and I would you know, throw a couple thousand bucks to, you know, per year, just say, Hey, you help me locate stuff. Um, and then, you know, I would just, you know, pay directly and, and, you know, off I went, I met a couple people in person at Starbucks where I live in New York to make transactions, guys who drove in from Long Island. I mean, it was, it, it was kind of a hustling year, 2010. But again, once the prices started to rise, a lot of the stuff started to, um, you know, come out. I remember again, people were like, Nat S. Turner is, that was my username is, you know, is like ra shilling and raising the prices, which I'm like, <laughs> you know, I'm just trying to buy these cards for my collection. Like, I'm not, you know, intentionally, like, yeah, I got outbid. Like, sue me. You know, I'm not actually shilling. Um, you know, I'm willing to pay that amount for the card. Like, <laughs> whatever. Uh, so, you know, that was that's, and then again, more cards started to come out as the prices started to rise. Um, but then, you know, I think about four or five years ago, there's only 20 versions of some of these cards, uh, under 50 versions. People who are true collectors realize the run on these cards, and then they they bought them, and now they're truly a lot of them are truly in collections that'll never sell, mm -hmm. um, such as mine, such as a few friends of mine, and, and um, 
I think it's going to be a lot harder now. Uh, you know, I hope it's not because I hope there's someone like me is coming into the hobby today. They have a chance to pick up these cards. But um, you know, it's uh, you know, it's definitely harder today than it was back then to locate them. <clears throat> Do you think there is some sort of shilling going on in certain areas? Yeah, I know there is. I mean, I've seen the patterns. Like, I even know some of the, like the usernames. You can figure it out on eBay. Um, for rare cards, I don't care as much because they're so rare. I was saying this to you earlier. Like, you kind of just you have to be willing to pay what you what you're willing to because you may never see the card again. But on some of the like Jordan PSA 10 rookies, you know, that was the first not the first time. That was a great example of that uh, when they they went up to like 40 grand like a couple years ago, and then scarcity value again, it's pure market supply and demand. Like. It doesn't work if supply can can be changed. Um, but you know, I think you know the owners of card, the consigners of cards to some of these auction houses on eBay. I think bid up their cards. Um, eBay has personally, uh, my opinion on this, eBay has a lot of work they 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 could and should do. I don't know if they care because it would hurt their revenue. But the the true, I think the only people who can fix this is actually eBay itself. Um, the reputable auction houses like Heritage and Golden could could as well, but they haven't really become mainstays for modern basketball cards. As the prices are continuing to rise, I think they they might start taking interest. Um, Golden, I was talking about earlier, sold the one of these one of one LeBron rookies for like three hundred thousand dollars, and so they're they're getting more interest, you know, because they make money in commissions. So they're getting more interest in modern cards. Um, they they can protect shilling. I think some of those guys can because they they're there's much more attention being put onto the bidders and, you know, verifying the bidders and, you know, ensuring that it's not the consigner and like stuff like that. Um, but yeah, I think it is a problem and you just have to be really diligent. Like I have a weird memory, as I said before. So like I can, you know, and I, I'm on eBay a lot. <laughs> and so, you know, I kind of know what prices are. And so like, I just will tap out if something's, you know, getting crazy and then obviously being shilled. The rare cards, like I said, it's tough. Like you you kind of have to put up with it if you really care about the card. Yeah. <clears throat> but usually what I tell people is just put in a snipe for the highest price you're willing to pay and yeah. let, it, let it go, right? No, don't worry about it. Yeah. Try not to freak out or lose sleep. Um, in general, by the way, my advice is be patient. I mean, uh, you know, be disciplined. Like, pay what you're willing to pay and be disciplined about it. Don't get caught up in hype. Um so I think the run up of uh, you know modern guys like Ben Simmons and Tatum and these folks like you can kind of see that happening. The in baseball the I can't even pronounce his name the the pitcher on the Angels. I mean like some of the run up in those cards obviously being sh I mean clear it had to be shilled like you know number to a hundred cards that are selling for like fifty grand like that just shouldn't happen with a with a rookie that just hasn't proven himself. But uh, yeah, it's a problem. So. <clears throat> Talk about the Jordan Green PMG, sort of what it means to you, the chase to get it, uh, maybe some stories on opportunities you've had you've had to get it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I physically held four of the ten. Um, I know I know where four of them are, five of them. Um, you know the one that was pulled allegedly, I think it was, but uh, a few years ago the PSA graded authentic and Joe Orlando posted about. I had a chance to buy it. I, I should have probably just been willing to pay. Yeah, just an example to our prior conversation about this. You know, I don't regret it because I thought it was worth what I offered. But, you know, with a card that rare, number to 10, there's not really a definition of market value because there's not a lot of – it's kind of a one price, single price auction. Like whatever one person is willing to pay is what it's worth. So I, I somewhat regret that. Uh, I do regret that. Um, I've had a cup, but, you know, a lot of them were held internationally, and I wasn't really willing to – you know, transact that amount of money without traveling there. I didn't want to travel there. Um, you know, I was just nervous about it in hindsight. And so the people who put in the legwork, uh, you know, got, got those, those four or five cards and I'm happy for them. And I hope, I hope they sell me one one day. <laughs> is that your but, number, uh, is that your number one chase? What's that? Is that your number one chase? Um, in terms of a card? Yes. Yes, yes, it is. Can you rattle off some other ones? That, that one and the other, the only Flair Legacy masterpiece, Jordan ninety seven ninety eight that I do not own. Which so. is a crazy sentence that you just said. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've seen it before, I suppose. Well, that's a uh, go ahead. No, no, I would say that, and then the, there's an Olympic Auto Jordan Michael Jordan card that not many people know exists. I know a person who has two of them, and I've never seen another. Um, that would be the next chase so 
Um, There's but, a lot of parts I want. I could list off probably a hundred of them. Yeah, just sort of like the, you know, the Mount Rushmore of them. I'm well, I'm not gonna say all of them because then I know people who show me How about that. <clears throat> I'll show you on the the Jordan Green PMG. Um, yeah, bring it on. <laughs> I'll stop like really early in the. <laughs> I'm saving for the, I'm saving for your for the penny, right? I gotta save up for the green penny. That's right. Um, so you sort of we sort of segued into this next question. Can you tell like we've all seen the thread, and I'll post a link in the I'll post a link to the thread below. But you posted a pretty epic thread on some Jordan masterpieces you acquired, and then a bunch of other high end nineties. And I think you referenced that you got it from uh, one or two collectors that you had met up with. Can you just tell us that story? Yeah, so there's two different transactions. So yeah, um, on the masterpieces, a really good friend of mine in the hobby, um, who will remain nameless for this, is a you know longtime collector like myself, similar age. You know, got the same reasons, nostalgia. You know, kind of driving a lot of the purchasing. And um, he's much better than I am at at kind of locating through private dealings. You know, I, I don't, I don't know. I'm not very good at the whole like finding out where in the, in this case it was in america but like who you know tracking down through like like pretty in-depth you know like detective type work to find out who has these cards i mean i figured out like a blog post from 1998 and like all this different stuff and so card shop that it closed down he you know found the phone number of the owner and like the business listings and like, <laughs> so there's a lot of sleuthing that he was able to do to figure out who owned these these you know two the 98 ultra masterpiece and one of the 97 flare masterpieces um i already owned two and this is one of the other two i didn't own and and um so he he purchased them as part of a giant collection and then was kind enough to allow me i think i i'm more of a michael jordan player collector than than he is um so he was willing and he knows that you know if a card goes to me you know it's it's special i'm going to treat it that way and not you know flip it um and so that was that one again i owe him a lot of gratitude for that for that find and, and allowing to purchase it and then and you know i we buy and sell things you know i know he's a big collector of other cards that i don't uh collect as much and so if i find something you know I'll make sure he gets it on the other one you know i've kind of said look i'm open for business you know if there's people out there with player collections or just great 90s collections that want an easy transaction you know i'm not going to take advantage of them at all I'll pay them an absolutely fair price um but i may think you know i'm fortunate enough to be able to do that and in this case, you know, someone who I trust uh, contacted me who, you know, from my same state where I grew up in Texas and, you know, we had done some transactions before. So there was some trust and he kind of said, look, I need some, you know, a kind of a simple transaction here and put together a package of cards that is about 30 cards that um, all of which I, I actually own 28 of them already, but two of them I did not. And, um, you know, I wanted those two, but I also you know, don't mind having duplicates of some of these really rare cards, especially nowadays. And so was able to get that, that as well. And, um, it just so happened the the two masterpieces came back from PSA on the same day. I, I met up with the guy to pick up the giant lot, the 30 card lot. We met, he flew up to New York, uh, grateful to him for doing that. So I didn't have to travel, but, uh, yeah, I, I, I got home with a duffel bag of Jordan and Kobe cards and there was a box from PSA on my, uh, on my desk as well, <laughs> which was pretty cool. So I scanned them all, and it was probably the most epic scanning, card scanning night I ever had. <laughs> it was one of the most epic threads, just like looking, because they're, they're, yeah. your pic, their picture you had, they were just kind of like stacked on each other, and like ones that are half hidden are like <laughs> these insanely epic cards. Yeah, it's well, it's a funny story. He met up, I was at my the gym I go to, and I was like, yeah, do you mind meeting me there? It's like the only time that works for both of us, and he came there, and we're meeting on the table in the lobby of the gym and there's just like PMG reds and like, you know, like spread a crime. People are walking by like these two total nerds are like going into Excel spreadsheets and looking at cards. But, um, yeah, that's how that one went down. The masterpiece one, you know, pedigree is really important to me or, or pedigree is probably the wrong word, but, um, provenance, like tr being able to track back the card to the pack basically. And uh, in those cases, in both cases, in the in large lot purchase as well as the masterpiece purchase, we were able to. I was able to do that. Um, you know, with like seeing receipts, for example, from 2001, uh, or in the case of the masterpiece, an, a, an actual, you know, article on with the collector with the card, you know, and like being able to match it to the who's who's owned it since. Um, and that that went a long way with PSA actually. So I, I got you know, literally, I got on the phone and traded emails with the CEO of PSA to. To, to make sure that, you know, special handling, but also that, you know, that they knew the provenance, so that there wasn't a question. <clears throat> I was going to ask you at this point, are you, are you 
calling PSA and telling them like I'm sending you, you know, crazy stuff. Get ready. Yeah, no, I do that now. Well, I had a bad experience with Beckett. I, they know this. I mean, I sent a Jordan Playmakers theater card to them, a LeBron Topps Contemporary red, or no, gold, number to 25, and a uh, LeBron rookie Patchworks ruby, number to 50, insured and everything through USPS, and it never showed up. And the card, the Playmaker, showed up on eBay seven weeks, seven days later, same serial number, as did the LeBron. Someone who worked at the post office or was it FedEx? It was post office. Slit the open the mailer and took the cards out. Uh, I found the person. I tracked them on eBay. I actually happened to know someone senior at eBay. I got the you know right contact for the seller. I, it was a card shop in Dallas, where Beckett is. And um, and uh, from that point forward, I never sent anything to Beckett ever again because wow. I, it wasn't Beckett's fault. It was just someone clearly sniping, you know, the uh, address and oh, it's a you know going to them. Um, and so I only deliver things in person now to Beckett and to PSA. I, um, have a special way of sending, you know, basically that doesn't go directly to them. Wow. But you still have a ton of BGS stuff that you don't want to, you know, you don't want to convert because you like the dates on them. Yeah. I like Beckett for nineties cards. Um, cause the date added, you know, field that they have PSA doesn't have a date added field in their pop report or card lookup, but you know, I know when I got most of the cards graded and you can kind of figure it out based on serial numbers. I prefer the PSA slab. It's thinner. Uh, I like the, the aesthetic of it more, but the, I, I like the Beckett cases. Uh, I think they have a lot of work to do on, on taking the authentication 90 stuff seriously though. PSA does too. They both do. But, um, yeah, I'm not going to convert stuff from, from Becca to PSA mainly, unless it's a set where I just want everything uniform. Um, but, you know, the, the Jordan stuff, for example, you know, I'm, that'd be a lot of work also to convert a thousand cards from Becca to PSA. The, the PSA people would probably kill me. Um, yeah, I don't have any intention of doing that. This is great, man. These are a lot of great stories. Do you have any uh, wrap up last minute advice for everybody out there? Um, it's a good question. Yeah, I would say, I mean, it's kind of what I said before, don't get caught up in, you know, for the money, uh, you know, collect what you, you know, remember scarcity value is probably the only advice I give folks, like collect things that are truly scarce if you actually care about, you know, not losing your money. Um, you know, don't, <laughs> never risk more than you're willing to lose, you know, because some of these cards truly can, you know, be, be flashes in the pan. But, you know, collect what you love. Uh, you know, if you care about basketball, collect basketball. If you like, you know, LeBron, collect LeBron. Uh, you know, uh, maybe maybe don't love collecting players who aren't going to be good in five years. <laughs> I tend to like players who are generational athletes. Those tend to do well from an investment perspective. Um, yeah, that's what I would say. Put put Be willing to put the time in. And, oh, and uh, my it doesn't hurt my case, but uh, don't sell. <laughs> Generally speaking, you'll regret it. <laughs> I have uh, some some big '90s pennies that are kind of popping up, uh, yeah. uh, all at the same time here, and I'm I'm like, should I sell some of my LeBron to you'll fund all, it? You'll, you'll regret it. And I'm just like, I don't think I can. <laughs> yeah, you'll regret it. I you know I understand the the you know motive of like, okay, there's a card here that's rarer than this card. I will never see that one. I might see this one again. Could understand that, but more likely than not, you'll regret it. Yeah. So. All right, man. Again, appreciate you coming on. Yeah. This was great. Um, yep. Thanks. All right. Yeah, man. Collect on. See ya. See ya.